Thanks, Caleb. Uh, let's have a look through this psalm together and see what God has to say to us this morning. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, that your word trains us in all things necessary for godliness and to honor you. Thank you that it reveals the wonder of who you are and of who we are and our desperate need for you. We pray that this morning that we would relish in Psalm 25 and uh, the hope that you offer in this psalm to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I, if I'm honest, I don't have much of a memory of the past. I, I find things difficult to keep in mind all the time. But one memory I've still get a, got in my head from ages past when I was a little kid. Uh, you know, I was a little homeschooled, freckly lad at the time. And my parents, they take me and my siblings to some family friends and we have a meal there. And maybe you kids would know what it's like when you walk into a room and you see the most perfect looking lolly jar you've ever seen. And when I walked into this room, I still remember seeing how perfect this lolly jar was. And I couldn't take my eyes off it throughout the entire meal. And I just kept looking at this incredible lolly jar until after the meal and all the adults went off into the living room and I stayed in the kitchen and I popped open that lolly jar and I quickly took one and put it in my mouth. And as soon as I'd done that, the parents that were all coming back. I heard them all coming back and I quickly dove underneath the dining table. And that was terribly open hiding. So it was shocking. And they all come in. They see me under there and my cheeks turn red. And they're like, what are you doing under there, Matt? And, or Matthew John, I think my mum said. Um, and... Uh, just that shame that came over me. But not only that, I realized after having a few bites after they're asking me, and they told me that that lolly jar was fake. Those lollies in there were made of plastic. And then everyone started laughing at me, and it just made it all worse. I just wanted to sink right down into the floor in that moment. And I still remember that moment as a kid and the shame that came over me. And uh, I imagine many of you can relate to moments, either in the past or present, where you felt that shame, that sense of shame come over you. You feel this when you know you've done the wrong thing and feel just like a terrible person. And not only that you've done the wrong thing, but that you've been found out. Or simply the thought of being found out brings this sense of shame. And that memory of mine is, is stuck there. I've even dreamt about it, feeling just wanting to leave that alone in nightmares. And I, I know I'm not alone in this sense of shame. We've all felt moments of shame, and some more than others. Times when you felt worthless. Moments that you want to stay hidden Never to see the light of day. Never for anyone else to find out about. You just think about it at times and that same feeling of shame washes over you again. And maybe you've felt shame because of a relationship that's gone ugly. Or a dark secret in your teenage years that would bring you shame. Or an addiction that you've been successful in keeping hidden but if anyone ever knew about it, ever found out about it, you'd feel even worse. Or, or actions or thoughts in just this past week that you wouldn't want everyone else in this room knowing about. This emotion of shame is hardwired into us and it's there for a good reason. To help us know what's in us, and to turn us to God. So how do we deal with this sense of shame? In Psalm 25, a psalm that sounds very psalmish, when I first read it, it sort of just wafted over me as a nice psalm, but now I treasure it, and I pray you will as well as we go through it. This psalm deals a lot with shame, and it teaches us what to cry out to God when shame comes. 
It's written by David, and it begins and ends with the desire to not be put to shame, because David knows this feeling of shame. And so he cries out to God in Psalm 25. It's an acrostic psalm, meaning that every verse begins with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Uh, They could have done that just as a way to remember it, or maybe it just sounded nice as they sung it. But here we're given the A to Z of the three cries to make in the midst of shame. The first cry in facing shame is, guide me. Guide me, that David cries. David cries to God and asks, you know, don't let it be me. I know those who reject you, they'll be shamed in the end. But me, guide me in your ways. So I'm not put to shame in the end. Look at verse 1 to 3 and see how it begins. He says, it's of David. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, in you I trust. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. Indeed, none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. And so David cries out against his enemies. They'll be shamed in the end. He knows that. Everyone who waits on God shall not be put to shame. But as he cries out against his enemies, David's own conscience is pricked because he knows He's a sinner as well. Proud, envious, at times murderous. And so what does David need? Well, he needs a guide. David wants God to light up his way like an airport runway at night where you need those lights to be able to land. He wants God to light up his path so that he knows the way to go. Guide me, God, he prays. Look at 4 to 5. That's what he asks. Make Me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all the day long. Guide me and I won't be put to shame. For your ways are never shameful. Because only God knows the right path. We're too small to see our own way clearly. Like We're like a little ant on a beach ball. They don't know what's coming around the next corner, the next curve. It can't, they, they can't see what's up ahead. It needs guidance. And God looks down on his world that he created and he sees, he knows how we should live. And David knows this. And so he cries out to God, guide me. And David just keeps crying out for this again and again in this psalm. He desperately wants God's way because he knows God's way won't put him to shame in the end. God's way holds no shame in the end. And I want us to just take a moment to think of what David prays for here in the midst of trouble. This idea of guiding me. David's facing his enemies But what does he pray? He doesn't pray that his troubles and distresses will all be taken away. He prays that God would guide him in the right paths during his distresses and troubles. He knows that there's an important, a more important thing than just feeling better about his life, just his enemies going away, and just his troubles and distresses all go away. He knows the most important thing in those struggles, in those stresses, is that God would guide him on the right path in those times. And how, how so often in our lives, when we're feeling down, or when we're tired or exhausted or people around us aren't treating the way they sh- us the way they should, that we just feel like lashing out or giving up. And we pray, God, take all this away from me instead of praying, God, help me to follow your ways in this. But David knows this is the prayer he needs to pray. Guide me in my troubles and distresses. I was sick um, just this week, down and out. Uh, lying on the bed, and what a great prayer I should have been praying instead of, God, help me to be feeling better out of this misery. But God, help me to be faithful to my wife. Help me to be loving and generous to my kids. Help me to be as faithful as I can in my sickness instead of bemoaning everything going on. 
And what a prayer David prays in his trouble, in his distresses, that he'll be... And he prays this prayer because he knows that God loves to do this. That God loves to hear the cry of, guide me. And David keeps crying this throughout the psalm in verse 8. You see it there. He says, good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. And verse 9, he leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. So our first cry in our shame, the first cry David makes here is to humbly call out to God, guide me in your paths. Show me the right way. And the second cry in our shame is what David cries out here is not only guide me, but guilty me. To say to God, I am guilty, I am shameful, I need you. I need you to remember your love, your goodness, and I need you to forget my sin, my shame. And today, not too many people like to do this. Lots of people pretend to prefer to pretend that there is no shame. But if we're all honest with ourselves, there's too much shame to go around. Simply the thought of, of every moment, every word, every action being up on this screen of your entire life and all of us watching it is enough to bring shame, the thought of shame on ourselves and for our stomachs to turn. Shame is there to drive us to our knees before God. David is wise enough to know this, so he cries out to God, guilty me. Please don't remember my sin, my shame. Check out verse 6 and 7. That's what he says. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they've been from of old. Remember not, forget the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness. O oh Lord. And so he cries, guilty me. I can't hide it any longer. The sins of my youth that haunt me, the sins of my youth that stay with me, the sins of my youth that I can't forget, save me. Forget them and remember your love. Often shame and sin they drag us down like seaweed at the beach. But, but many people don't do what David does here. Instead, the temptation is to try and handle it ourselves, handle our own strength and deal with our shame ourselves. And so we try to hide it. We try to move on with it. We try to deal with shame in other ways. But it, inevitably, it just bubbles up. We feel it. And so today, you see that when... So many of us focus so intensely on how we look on the outside, how we, how we portray ourselves to others on the outside and become obsessed with diets and exercise and fashion so that we can look good on the outside despite what's going on in the inside. And that's one way people try to deal with this shame. They, they focus on what's the external because they want to look good in front of other people knowing that the internal is still full of shame. We try to disguise what's going on inside. Or at times it surfaces in people in, in their loneliness, determined not to let anyone else in and see who we really are. There's this fear that we have of rejection because of our shame. But it also surfaces at times in our joylessness. It surfaces in a lack of passion for life because of the shame we know in our own lives. We have this sense of dread that we'll be exposed before too long and people really know that we are shameful. So we barricade ourselves in these false fronts. We barricade ourselves to look good in front of others uh, by our appearance, or we barricade ourselves by locking ourselves away and not letting anyone else in, or we barricade ourselves by just distracting ourselves completely. We have 
more and more things to engage our attention so that we don't need to think about our shame. And so people binge Netflix to hide our pain, or we binge on food to get rid of our shame, or we buy something shiny and new to distract ourselves for a while, to deceptively feel better about ourselves. But it's all a sham. It's all a sham that tries to hide our shame. Instead, the answer lies in crying out that God would forget our shame. That he would forget our sin because of his steadfast love. That's what it says in verse 7, for his steadfast love. And in verse 11, it gives us another reason for him to forget. Look at verse 11. David cries out again, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Now, David doesn't bother pleading in verse 11, forgive me because I've been a good guy. I haven't been that bad, so just pardon me because I'm doing all right. Or because my guilt is small even, and my good is much higher. No, he comes right out. He says, my sin is great, but for your name's sake, O Lord, pardon me. And that idea of namesake is like, A doctor, you know, a doctor doesn't get a good reputation for just solving uh, a a small case of sickness or an everyday case that anyone else could solve. A doctor's reputation of success is built on saving the hard cases, the cases that no one else could save. And so God's name is praised when in his mercy he pardons great guilt that deals with all shame. And so David fears this great God who pardons guilt for his name's sake. He fears this great God who is glorious and mighty and powerful. Because of this God, because of his name, because of his character, it is possible to be close friends with him, despite our shame. Even though God knows you inside and out, He makes a promise to those who fear him, to those who seek him, to be their friend. Look at verse 14. That's what it says. The friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant, his promise. I find that verse... Amazing, a friend who knows your shame and sticks by you. That's powerful. Because God pardons for his name and he, def- and he befriends those in shame, those who fear his name. And he plucks them from danger in verse 15. And so David cries out again to this great God, growing in confidence. And he cries out again, be gracious to me in my loneliness, in my afflictions, in my troubles, in my distresses. Forgive me. Guilty me, he cries. And he begs for grace in 16 to 18 there. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I'm lonely and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Consider my affliction and my trouble and forgive all my sins. And so is this your cry in shame? Do you know your desperate need for forgiveness? Have you cried out to God, guilty me, I need you? Without this cry, we cannot deal with our shame. Guide me, guilty me. And the third cry there is guard me. There are those who hate me, those who would love to see me be put to shame. And David knows that he's put all his eggs in one basket. They're all in God. And so he waits for him alone in verse 19, 21 there. He says, Consider how many are my foes, and with violent, what violent hatred they hate me. Oh, guard my soul and deliver me. Let me not be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. 
And so David has cried for guidance. He's seen his guilt and desires grace. But he still knows he needs one more thing. He needs a guard and his only hope is God. Because the truth is we can't guard ourselves. We can't be perfect. In the end, we will be exposed if we rely on ourselves. The only guard against final shame is God himself. So cry out to him. And with those these three cries, guide me, guilty me, guard me. That's how we deal with shame that we feel in our lives. But the big question, I think, in this psalm that still hangs over us is this contradiction it has in verse 3, where it says, they will be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. They, those sinners will be ashamed. But in verse 8, where it says, therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. How does he deal with sinners, different sinners, in completely different ways? How can God shame some but instruct others? How can he forgive any sinner who's full of shame? How's it really possible for God to wipe our shame away when we cry out to him? And the answer, of course, can only be fully understood in Jesus Christ. And when we think of Jesus Christ, our God, who didn't just observe our shame from afar. But he became one of us and knew incredible humiliation. When you think of the Lord of glory who becomes a child in a womb, or the Lord of glory who suffers shame for 33 years of existence here on earth. The Lord of glory who endured the shame of the cross, the shame of his enemies, the shame of our sin on his shoulders. And then he cries, at the end of that cross, he cries, it is finished. And, and part of what that means is shame is finished. All that is necessary for our forgiveness is finalized, is complete, is finished. And so Hebrews 12 says, fix our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he endured this cross, despising the shame because of the prize set before him and the glory set before him. He knew shame, yet saw it as nothing so he could redeem us from our shame. Jesus makes it possible for us to cry to God, remember me, but not my sin. And when all secrets are revealed, and one day they will be, when everything is revealed, Jesus has stood in our place. He was exposed. He was mocked. He was derided. He was shamed for us. And so we have this incredible hope by faith that on that last day, because of Jesus, as Caleb read in, in Hebrews 11, where it says, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. God has prepared a place for us. And if we cry out to him in our shame because of Jesus, God is not ashamed to be our God. Maybe you felt that if someone knew you truly, knew every single thing about you, knew all your shame, then they would leave. They would despise you. They wouldn't be able to hang around you. They wouldn't be able to look at you the same way again. But God, he looks at us in our shame and knows it so much more completely than we even know it ourselves. Knowing everything about us and he loves us. And on that last day, he will guard all those who put their faith in him. And so today... If you're sitting here 
And maybe you're sitting here as we go on about shame all the time and you actually don't feel too much shame. We talk about this thing we all have in common, but you actually feel like, no, I, I don't really feel that, that much. It's not really that bad. Maybe you've bought the lie, you've tried to convince yourself that there's nothing to really be ashamed of. Know this, that every one of us are full of shameful things. Now, some in our society don't realize that their shame is so shocking. Just like back in Philippians, uh, when Paul spoke to them, he said, some glory in their shame so that our culture sears and we sear our own conscience so that we think wrong is right and right is wrong. And so I plead with you today, don't squash down your shame. Don't try and minimize your shame. Don't try and excuse away your shame. But cry out to God in your shame. And Jesus offers to bear it for you. If not, there comes a day where you will be exposed before God. And there will, that will be a day where you wish you hadn't been born. And for others of you who, hear, who are here and you, you feel shame, this week you'll probably feel shame again. When you feel like a terrible person because you failed again, when the voices in your head say, give up, you're nothing, look at how terrible you are, you failed again as a mother or as a father or as a sibling or as a worker or, or you, you've, you've done it again. Know that in Christ you are loved in everlasting love so you can cry out to God. So stop. When you cry out to God in your shame, then stop dwelling on your shame. Sometimes Christians, I've talked about this before, sometimes Christians can deceive themselves into feeling more holy because they dwell on their shame and what a terrible person they are. No, there's nothing more holy about that. That's just denying the truth of the gospel. It's not finding joy in God's forgiveness. A godly repentance moves on from our shame and our sin, realizing in Christ there is no more shame. We feel shame, we cry out to God, and we rest in Him knowing in Christ there's no more shame. No more shame. It's like one 90-year-old man, uh, I'll, I'll finish this, one 90-year-old man, he, he sent for his preacher, his preacher was Harry Ironside, and he sent for him because he said everything is so dark, his memory of all his shame in his life kept replaying itself in his life, and it's all he could think about. And so Harry Ironside, he turns to Psalm 25 and he goes through this psalm with this 90-year-old man. And eventually, this 90-year-old man says, I am an old fool remembering what God has forgotten. Don't deny the gospel. Don't jib God's goodness. Don't be an old fool remembering what God has forgotten. Because here, here is joy in forgiveness. Here is hope for eternity. Here is a life with no more shame, with a God who forgets our sin and forgives our guilt. Let's praise God for this good news. Father, we thank you that you have done an incredible thing for us. For us who don't deserve it, who deserve to wallow in our shame, in our sin, in our guilt. And yet, you have chosen to offer us forgiveness, to redeem us from our failures. And so we praise you, God, this morning. And we ask that you help us to keep running to you for guidance for forgiveness, for grace, and that you will guard us until the end 
on that last day when we come before you as our judge. In Jesus' good name we ask and pray. Amen.